Um, <coughs> so, as I've written on the blackboard, those of you who come with uh, Svetlana and me uh, to Chamonix uh, on, on uh, tomorrow, so I advise you to order a lunch box today because we have to depart at 1. As I told before, there are no appointments. It starts at 2, so uh, the secretary advised to be there at half past 1. And it takes roughly 20, uh, half an hour to go there. Okay, you can click on it. Thank you. Okay, so let me start this uh, third uh, hands-on uh, day uh, with a description of the MS spec package and after this description, uh, Sylvain will go to the hands-on themselves. Uh, so it is this one. Still the old, uh, the same. Is it better if I'm on the other side, or it's fine here? No, no, it's, it's fine here. Okay. Okay. So, no, it's not the right one. So what have I done? Ah, yes. So I'll put it. It's Control L. Control, Control, Control L. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, that will be a rather quick uh, description. So I will describe the, the legacy package, the one that has been published in computer physics communication. Uh, then the, the actual version, uh, which you will run later on, and uh, what we are working on. Uh, well, actually, some of the some of the new implementations are already available in the in the actual version, and then conclusions. So I'm going much too fast. Okay, so a standard experiment. So this is a cartoon you already saw in uh, Jan's talk. A standard experiment in physics to shine something onto a uh, onto a sample and just ju then measure the same something or something else. I'm not, I don't know if I'm clear. <laughs> uh, okay, so basically uh, this is a way to get, uh, to gain information about the sample or its surface. Uh, so again, the cartoon was shown by Jan. This is an example uh, from either uh, one photon in, uh, one electron out, or one photon in, one photon uh, out uh, spectroscopy. And you see with just one incoming photon beam, you can already have a lot of spectroscopies with, uh, uh, and with these spectroscopies you, you, can, uh, you can probe the matter and, and, and extract uh, very useful information uh, from this. So, uh, and you have some decay channels as well that you can uh, analyze. So MSPEC stands for Multiple Scattering Spectroscopy. Uh, it's a set of Fortran programs. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous version it was uh, uh, controlled by bash and CSH, CSH scripts. Now uh, Sylvain has replaced it by uh, Python scripts. And it can model a certain number of spectroscopies within the multiple scattering framework, which was the main topic of this uh, school. So uh, the developers of the first version, so the main developers were uh, Rino Natoli and myself. Uh, then I had, uh, um, there was a PhD student from uh, Morocco. There was my, my two PhD students, first PhD students here, uh, who worked on the, on the package, and Fabiana da Pieve, who is now somewhere in Brussels, I think, and KSK, who gave a talk as well. He was twice a postdoc in Rennes. Uh, so spectroscopies uh, that can be described in MSPEC, or are described for some of them, uh, it's uh, spectroscopies uh, for which it's the electron or the electrons that probe uh, the sample. So in blue I've put the spectroscopies that are contained in the actual version of the package. So it's uh, photoelectron diffraction, which is a byproduct of uh, photoemission, OG electron diffraction, lead, 
uh, and OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy, I uh, will come to it uh, later on. And so this is for a real electron, virtual electron, you, can, uh, you have X-ray absorption. Uh, so the common feature of all these spectroscopies, it is one or a few electrons uh, that probe the sample. So in the case of OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy, there are two electrons that probe the sample. And uh, the common description is what we've seen all these last 10 days or 11, uh, 10 days, it's the multiple scattering of the probe electron by the atom of the sample. So the legacy code is already described, these five spectroscopies. Uh, originally, uh, there was, a, you could do as well generation of molecular crystal nanotubes and fullerenes. I don't know, Sylvain, if this can be superseded by ASE. Uh, fullerenes and nanotubes, I guess so, okay. Uh, so these uh, were implemented by courtesy, uh, courtesy of uh, David Maskozowski uh, in Israel and the group of the University of Ghent uh, who have developed a very beautiful package uh, for full rents and all these, uh, these type of uh, materials. Uh, so this is again the list of uh, uh, spectroscopies that can be modeled and uh, I discussed this in my lecture, you've got also the computation of the spectral radius which is the key tool in order to check the convergence of the series expansion. Uh, they are, well, these are old slides, but uh, okay, in, yeah, that's right that in the standard package you have only three algorithms. Uh, now with Sylvain we are implementing uh, two more. Uh, three more. Uh, there is an old spin version, but it's not in the package uh, because uh, it it, it's in between one version 1.0 and version 1.1. I completely rewrote uh, the calculation of the scattering path operator and, and the order of the indices is not the same. Uh, as uh, you you can easily understand that when you increase a lot uh, the number of atoms, then the, the number of paths that the electron can travel becomes uh, huge. And many of them do not contribute sensi um, sensibly uh, to, the, to the result. So in order to speed up the calculations, you have to filter them. Uh, so there are several filtering options. Because the, the big difference between uh, photoelectron diffraction and X-ray absorption is the CPU time. Because in X-ray absorption, in terms of series expansion, you, for exafs, for instance, you only uh, have closed path. While uh, in uh, photoelectron diffraction, you have open path. So th th there is the f this is the first difference. And in addition, uh, the, the final L uh, here, the, L, the, the, the maximum number L here in X-ray absorption is limited by the dipole selection rule. Here it's only, it's only for the absorbing atom that is limited for the, by the dipole selection rule, but not for the, for the exit atom. And in that case, if you are at, uh, let's say, uh, so as, as the, the people who talked about extra absorption showed, usually you can limit your L max to three, four, five. Uh, here, if you, have, if you are at high energy, you can have to go to 20, 25, even 30 or more. So this will impact a lot, uh, the, the, the CPU time. Uh, so, uh, you can do different types of scans, so azimuthal polar full angle, so that means the stereographic projection. I, I will give you some examples uh, later, and energy scans as well. Uh, in, the, in the legacy version, uh, there is the, the importation of the external potential is with LMTO. This was something we did with Peter Krüger, who gave a, a lecture uh, on multi-channel on, on Monday. Uh, now, uh, Sylvain will show you that we have the, the, the importation of SPR, KKR potential, and uh, I will discuss others uh, later in my slides. Uh, okay, uh, in, the, in the old version, before uh, Sylvain took over, uh, the development of the, uh, to, to ease the use of the code, uh, there was a small, which is still there, there, there was a small uh, use, um, uh, graphical interface, uh, uh, which was like this. Uh, and so basically, so normally this is not the way you will run it now, but it's still there if you, if you want to play with it. Uh, so uh, as far as the structure is concerned, 
so this is an old slide because now the cluster generation is replaced by ASE. Uh, but th there are three, uh, three levels of computation. First, you need a cluster. Uh, then you either you compute, you, then you compute the, the, the T matrices. Either you do it internally or you do it from, uh, from an imported uh, ab initial calculation and then you have got the, the cross section. Okay, the, the rest I don't uh, talk much about it because it was in the previous version. So some examples here. Uh, some of them you already saw them in my uh, lecture. So here is a comparison between uh, multiple scattering uh, expansion and matrix inversion. So uh, here you've got a test cluster of, uh, of uh, magnesium oxide, one zero zero one, and the absorbing atom is at the bottom here. So you uh, collect uh, here. I don't remember in which direction it is, but you excite magnesium two p atom. Uh, electron and you collect in a given direction, uh, given phi uh, along uh, theta direction, you collect your electrons. And if you do the matrix inversion, so no approximation as far as the uh, multiple scattering is concerned, you obtain this. And if you uh, pile up the, the scattering orders, you, so you see that single scattering is completely uh, wrong. And uh, the more you increase the scattering order, the better. Uh, the agreement. So that's as a reasonably, it is as the reasonably low energy of 184 EV, which in this case I would think uh, will give you an L max of uh, 8 or 9, something like this. I would think. Now, uh, uh, another comparison between the scattering order is uh, with the stereographic projection. So if you look at the, the, the exact result from the scattering point of view, uh, matrix inversion and you see again here that okay it's not that good uh, the, the agreement with uh, scattering order one but then already at two you've all, uh, almost reached uh, the agreement. So this is when you collect the electron all over the surface that you get these uh, images. Uh, correlation expansion I already uh, discussed it in my uh, lecture but just uh, a, a quick reminder uh, so at uh, at energies where the series expansion converges, it converges faster. These are the, the dashed lines, is correlation expansion, and the full lines, it's a series expansion at order two and three. Uh, but the big advantage of this approach, as I said, is it's not perturbative, and uh, in that case, even at energies where the uh, series expansion doesn't converge, it converges. Although you need to go to, to a high order of expansion. Now, an example, a practical example. So this is something which, which is part of the PhD of uh, work of Thomas Jawen, who is now in, uh, in our group as a CNRS researcher. So uh, the idea was to test the method in order to, to learn about uh, incorporation of magnesium at an, the interface between a silver and, and a, a magnesium oxide. So first, the test was made on the, 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 the system, the pure, into quote, system. Uh, three monolayers of magnesium oxide on, on silver. So they are sketched here. And uh, then, uh, what uh, for those of you who are used with core level photoemission, uh, you know that uh, there is a split in the, in the peaks between the, 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 the bulk and the surface, that means the electrons that come from the bulk and the electron that comes from the surface. This is called the chemical shift. Uh, the shift can vary depending on the material, but this helps you to discriminate between uh, two, the two types of electrons. So you can say that, okay, this peak corresponds to uh, electrons <laughs> coming from, uh, from the surface. So in that case, it's uh, slightly more involved. You have three layers, but in practice, uh, you can decompose your uh, total photoemission core level peak into three contributions and each one coming from a different layer. So they are labeled, uh, one is the one close to the uh, surface of uh, silver, layer two, layer three. So you decompose this peak like this. It is something that's been uh, done in uh, photo emission for uh, whoa, 40 years, I think. Uh, the chemical shift was discovered in the 
70s, if I'm not mistaken. And so here you've got the, 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 your peak for different uh, positions of the analyzer. And if you do the angular variations, here it's in theta, the polar variations of the uh, uh, given peak, so a peak corresponding to a given layer, you see that they have, this is the experiment, uh, so you see that they have quite different modulations. And so the first uh, thing to do was to see if we could reproduce this uh, by the calculation in order to validate the decomposition, validate the method. And you see here, so this is the experiment, this is the calculation, and with the MS spec, so you see that we, we can reproduce fairly well, uh, rather well, uh, what is obtained from the, uh, from the um, uh, experiments. So that's sort of, uh, of a benchmark in order to to uh, test the method, the feasibility of what we want, which is studying something at the interface between these two uh, materials. So the next, the next step here is to uh, shine uh, some uh, uh, a flux of magnesium atom onto the material and try to identify where these magnesium atom atoms will incorporate. And in that case, you can uh, you have an extra peak that appears in your uh, decomposition, which is called C0 here. And then we focus on the angular variations of the C0 peak. And experimentally, they are given here. And then we make calculations for different, we test different positions of your of the, uh, the magnesium atom at the interface in the, um, in the calculations. And you see here you've got a really, uh, really good uh, agreement uh, between these two uh, structures. So this is an example of use of MSPEC. This is an example of uh, use of uh, photoelectron diffraction as a structure tool. Uh, now you saw this, so I'll, I'll go quickly to it. So the spectral radius as a test of the feasibility of um, uh, 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 multiple scattering expansion. Uh, so this w the experiments were done by uh, the group of uh, Jürgen Sturwalder and uh, Philippe Eby, the former group of, uh, where, where are you, Aki? <laughs> Here, uh, the former group of, uh, uh, the, the, the former um, head of the group where Aki Pukinan is, uh, is working. Uh, so they did these experiments in the in the 19 uh, in 1967. At, at, at that time, I was already puzzled because uh, they managed to express to to um, to, um, to to match perfectly their experiments with a single scattering calculation. Uh, and the experiments were done one at uh, something like 25 eV and the other one something like uh, 45 eV. So. I was extremely uh, surprised that you could have an agreement in single scattering. And then later on, uh, I visited uh, Jürgen Storwalder in Zurich and he asked me to do some calculations, photoelectron diffraction calculations on uh, uh, um, titanium dioxide. And then I was back to, to, to what I knew. That means that single scattering was not working. <laughs> But I reproduced this calculation in single scattering for copper and it was working perfectly well. So, and this is uh, effectively the spectral radius uh, that explains you, as I said the other day, it's here is the spectral radius for uh, a titanium dioxide. So here you see that at 25 eV it diverges. So you have no way to, to match uh, the matrix inversion with your single scattering. And uh, the same at 45 eV, it doesn't di diverge, but your spectral radius is very large. So I remember you that uh, you've got, let, let's take it as uh, for, for scalars, 1 minus x minus 1 is 1 plus, well, 1 plus x plus x2 plus etc. So here it's the same, but for matrices. And if your spectral radius, which corresponds to, so, so this converges only if the modulus of x is 1. And if your spectral radius, which is basically this, the, which co corresponds to this for scalars, if your spectral radius, uh, the lower your spectral radius, you see the faster your convergence. So uh, this explains that here, single scattering, OK, you, you, you start to feel some similarity, but you are still uh, far away. Uh, so you will need to go fur uh, further, but it will converge, well, while here it will never converge. So that means that in addition of being a test of the convergence or divergence of the uh, multiple scattering expansion, which, is, which up to now was the only method to, that you can use at high energy, uh, 
uh, it can give you as well some insight on the uh, truncation order of your series expansion. The Everything which is below one? Uh, it's convergence. So it because this is... Converge, it, it will converge. Inside. It will converge. But do you have to take uh, at least uh, 1 plus x? Or? This is because here you, you do the same but for a matrix. Okay, it's just uh, the, the similarity. Here you, you, you calculate the spectral radius. This is the, the, the equivalent of modulus of x in the matrix case. Yeah, but I only ask, so in the multiple scattering we have 1 minus d times uh, g0? Times yes, it's one. just, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just because your matrix normally, uh, it's t, t minus 1 uh, minus g0 which you can rewrite as t i minus g0 t, okay? So t doesn't uh, make any, any problem, and so it is this that, uh, the spectral radius of this that you use, so you can make, you, you, you can make the, the similar, you, you have the similarity with the, with the Taylor expansion. Yes, this is single scattering, 1 plus x2 will be double scattering, and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, now uh, by contrast, uh, so the, the spectral radius for uh, copper is much, much lower, and you see that at 25 EV you've got, uh, well, basically 0 0.65 or 6.7, and you see that the, 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 the agreement between uh, uh, single scattering and, and, and matrix inversion I is really good. But this is the explanation why, why single scattering works so well for copper and is disastrous for uh, titanium dioxide. And in general, you've got the, the spectral radius oscillates uh, with energy. And you see that the higher the energy, the lower the spectral radius. But then, of course, you have to uh, balance this with the fact that the higher the energy, the more atoms you have to take into account. And you see that when when you inc uh, increase the number of atoms, then the spectral radius goes up. So you can imagine th in the end that if you are at very high energy and you've got a very high, large number of atoms, you might run into troubles again with the converge as far as the convergence is, uh, is concerned. Ah, now, uh, I mentioned briefly uh, in my introductory talk uh, the optical theorem, and uh, I, I mentioned that the optical theorem was could be illustrated by the relationship between X-ray absorption and photoelectron diffraction. And the optical the theorem told you that the X-ray absorption uh, cross-section is nothing else than the integral over all space, and when I say all space is not only the surface, but below as well, all the 4 pi steregions, you integrate over all directions of space. And if there is no damping, you should get the agreement. So here is an example. So first, with a very uh, simple uh, seven-atom uh, structure. So here, here you've got, so it's only exafs. So uh, to, uh, to go back to the question of uh, Jaway the other day, and that Andra, uh, Andre Schipp answered. So this is the part uh, above 50, 60 EV. Okay, uh, where you've got these oscillations, and if you uh, take a Fourier transform, you've got your peaks that coincides with the positions of the, the, the shells of atoms around. So you see here uh, the, the, the different scattering orders for the calculation of X-ray absorption with MS-spec, and the comparison of order 7 with X-ray uh, with I inversion, that's fine. Uh, th that's excellent. Uh, and then you integrate over sets, in that case, uh, using um, Lebedev-Lakin uh, integration scheme uh, over 770 directions. And this is what you get. You say that at order, uh, so uh, at the beginning is completely wrong because you don't have enough uh, multiple scattering paths. Uh, to satisfy uh, the optical theorem, but when you go to order 8, for instance, and if you compare the X exact uh, X-ray absorption uh, inversion result with the uh, integration over all directions of uh, order 8 for uh, series expansion or inversion, you say that you've got an excellent agreement apart uh, from the lower energy case. Uh, Okay, this is just a zoom. Uh, then we can uh, 
try to see if we can, because it was a very small system. So let's take another larger system. So uh, 20, uh, 23 atom, it's always my test system of uh, uh, magnesium oxide. And here, of course, the more atoms you, you have, the, the more directions you need in order to integrate. So if I'm not mistaken, this is about the, you're familiar with the lebedev leitkin I think that's about the, the, the maximum of the, the directions that are the, the, re, that have the weights that have been tabulated by Lebedev and, and Leitkin. So here I integrate over 2,030 directions. And you see that already for the X-ray absorption, it's much more difficult to make it converge, uh, except in the higher energy regime. Uh, if you compare all the six uh, extra absorption to the matrix inversion, so the exact result, so here you invert exactly this, and in the other case you truncate to order six, you see that, okay, from about 100 TV you get a perfect agreement, but before you don't get agreement. And now the mess comes when you, uh, when you start to integrate over the photoelectron diffraction over all the directions. Uh, and you see that uh, order 5, which is uh, the, the maximum uh, I went to because of the, the CPU time, you see that order 5 just works uh, from uh, uh, 210 uh, onwards, and that's about all. But if you compare uh, the, the, the f uh, all angle integration of photoelectron diffraction in the inverse matrix inversion case, uh, inversion case with X-ray absorption, you see that they perfectly fit. So in that case, again, the optical theorem is satisfied. Okay, you can model lead images. So here there is a small discrepancy in the experiment. I don't know why I didn't do the calculation. That was a long time ago. I don't remember why I didn't bother to do the calculation at the same energy. But you see that, okay, basically you can reproduce uh, your lead pattern. I don't know if, uh, if Sylvain has uh, prepared something on lead. No, okay. But okay, the, you, you, can, uh, you can model a lead image as well. And then I come to OG photoelectron, uh, OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy. So, uh, the idea of photoelectron, uh, OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy, so you've got your, your light, you shine on your sample on a, on a core state, then you eject the photoelectron, then of course now you've got a hole, and the hole is filled by an electron from another level, and which results, the, the, the energy uh, gained by this uh, is uh, transferred to another electron of the same level or another level that can escape, and this is the OG electron. Uh, now, the idea of the OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy is to measure uh, the two electrons that originate from the same photoionization process. So in order to do this, you have to be fairly quick. <laughs> Uh, so, to not to be polluted by uh, OG electrons coming from another uh, atom around. So that means that in practice they do the measure, uh, they, they, they if they detect a photoelectron and an OG electron within 10 or 20 nanoseconds, they say, okay, we are sure that it comes from the same atom. And this is interesting because uh, it gives you, first it is more, uh, you know that in uh, in uh, photo emission, you have the, well, this was discussed uh, a lot, uh, the problem of the, the coral lifetime. Uh, you don't have this in OG photoelectron uh, coincidence spectroscopy because this is not, the, uh, the coral is an intermediate state, it's not your final state in that case. Uh, in addition, the um, uh, the, the, the mean free path is much shorter because when you have something like this, you have, in order to get the overall mean free path, you have to add the inverse of the mean free path. So that means uh, that you are much more sensitive to the surface. Uh, so in that case, uh, first, so we developed with uh, uh, Rino Natoli. Uh, Sergio Di Matteo, my colleague from Rennes, and Fabiana da Pieve, who was at that time a PhD student of uh, Gianni Stefani in Rome. We developed a multiple scattering approach uh, to the spectroscopy uh, because originally the spectroscopy was only performed in atomic physics. So in that case, they had codes to model the spectroscopy, but these codes were rel relying on the rotational invariance of the system. So that means that when you deal with the crystals, 
this is not valid anymore. So they couldn't use the atomic scattering, uh, the atomic physics code, so they asked us to develop something. But first, we, we, we tested uh, our uh, approach on, uh, on just an atom, to just to check that we could get the same result, results as the, atomic, uh, as the atomic physics code. So we did it with the uh, argon. So this, uh, this, ray, this uh, OJ line of argon, L3, M23, M23, in coincidence with the uh, 2P3 uh, photoelectron at an energy of uh, 253.6 EV. And this is the position of the photoelectron detector. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, in their experiment, they have seven detectors, I think. Uh, I think they have five for the OG and two for the photoelectron. Okay, anyway, you see that uh, this is the, the, our calculation and this is the experiments. You, you see that we've got uh, a, a good agreement. So next, uh, having sort of uh, benchmarked uh, our, our uh, theory uh, with the atomic uh, theories, uh, we did it on uh, germanium. So uh, the... Uh, the, 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 the so the, the experiment was done with uh, by uh, the group of uh, Gianni Stefani. Uh, it was done uh, in Eletra, uh, in Trieste, and uh, Rocco and Gotter. And here is the. I um, know uh, it's yes, it's five detectors for. Uh, okay, this is what I said. So here is a comparison uh, between the. So in the case of germanium. Uh, this OG line germ of the germanium with the 2P3 half. Uh, so first, we just uh, do the comparison for the OG, not the coincidence uh, result. So we see that uh, we have uh, 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 a very good description. And then we made the comparison for the, for the OG photoelectron spectroscopy. So you see that up to here, the agreement is good. Here, we've got a problem, but it's only one single uh, experimental point. So we cannot say if it's the theory which is wrong or if there, is a, there has been a problem with the, with the spectra. So we ask them if we, please, could you uh, redo the experiment? Because uh, they said, no, it's too complicated. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think there are three uh, experimental setup, setups in the world. So there is a one in Trieste and there is, uh, the, the, I think there are two in the US or maybe one in, in Australia and one in the US. Well, anyway, this is just to show you another type of spectroscopy, uh, which is extremely surface sensitive. Now, muffintin versus non-muffintin. So the, 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 this was uh, shown by many people. It was shown by Hubert. It was shown, I guess, by uh, Jan. Um, I don't remember. Uh, it was shown by Keiske. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a comparison that was made uh, uh, using VIN2K by Peter Blaha. I th and uh, actually, it's a very well known, uh, uh, very well known figure, but uh, nobody knew who was at the origin of the figure. It was, and we, when we published this blue book, we had to, uh, to know exactly where the figure was coming from. And I remember uh, uh, I wrote to Caroline Schwartz, uh, so the first developer of uh, VIN2K, and he told me, ah, it's uh, Peter Blaha who, who did it, but uh, okay. But it was not easy to track down the origin of the figure. Okay. Uh, now, this is, uh, I come to a full potential uh, photoelectron diffraction. So it's not implemented in the standard code, but it's available <laughs> uh, if, if you are interested. Uh, so for the moment, uh, there have been uh, two, three calculations done. Uh, so I come back to, uh, to some results that were shown by KSK Hatada. Uh, uh, on the, the K edge, uh, X-ray absorption K edge of uh, GECL4. So as he showed you, uh, if you just do a Muffin-Din calculation, you cannot match uh, correctly uh, the two bumps here. There is one missing. This is the green line. And you need full potential in order to, to do this. So uh, we decided to have a try with, uh, with MSPEC to see what was the effect of uh, full potential at very low energy. Uh, on the, so we decided to take exactly the position of this uh, bump here that was not 
uh, that was missed by the muffin tin calculation and to do a f uh, uh, full, uh, full potential uh, photoelectron diffraction calculation at this very same energy. And here is the result. So here this is uh, the muffin tin calculation and here this is the full potential calculation. And you see that, okay, uh, there are, no it's not 5, it's 7 EV and you see that there are substantial uh, differences. So, just to say that it's in the code, but not in the standard version, the full potential. And it's been used recently as well by uh, Fukiko Ota, and uh, Keisuke told, about, uh, told you about this, uh, this sort of time result, photoelectron diffraction, and I will come to it again in a moment. Uh, so, as I said uh, at the very beginning of my talk here, uh, the code was published uh, back in, uh, I don't remember, uh, 2011. <laughs> Uh, so at that time uh, you had to generate a cluster, so now it's AAC that was do doing it, and generate the potential and compute the cross-section. Uh, now, so this is the, 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 the cycle uh, to, uh, to do the calculation. So you st have an experiment, you start, your, you, you take a, a, a test cluster, which you hope to will match your uh, experiment, compute the potential, and then you compare and so in order to compare uh, uh, the experiment to the potential, so comparing two curves, uh, so uh, you've seen in uh, later, I don't remember who showed, uh, yeah, uh, Ben Fato showed some R-factor analysis. So R-factor in photoemission is the traditional way to, to do it, but it's not very good because uh, when you do an R-factor comparison between two, uh, two curves, uh, you compare po uh, uh, point by point the two curves. That means that you miss, you can miss the shape of the curve although some R factors uh, in, uh, include the, like the Pendry or the Zanadi uh, uh, Jona, uh, they, can, they, they involve derivatives. So it's from this point of view, it's not very good because you miss the, the shape of your, uh, of your point. So uh, I've implemented many other ways uh, to, to compare two curves, including either mathematical distances or what I prefer uh, I find more uh, easy to deal with than uh, its uh, shape analysis method. Uh, the idea of the shape analysis method, so shape analysis method, you compare two objects. Here you've got a curve. So what you do, you take your curve and you make uh, an object with it. You just uh, take the first point and the last point and you group them together. And then you've got an object and you can uh, use all the shape analysis methods. So I won't go into the details, but there are many, many ways to, uh, to do it. And in that case, you take the shape of your peaks into account. And you, don't, uh, and you don't compare necessarily one by one. And you can compare also what in, in shape analysis, the, 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 the uh, in the shape analysis language, uh, you compare what they call descriptors. So if, you if I translate into the R factor, for the R factor, the descriptors will be the points of your curve. But you can use either the descriptors. Uh, for instance, you can use the moments. If you calculate the moments, you will have in each moment some information encoded about the shape. So you can use moments or you can use, so in the case of shape analysis, you can use arcs, you can use uh, all sorts of things. So this is available. I think uh, Sylvain has tested some, uh, some other methods. So here is an, uh, so there is a, a side code in MSPEC that allows you to make these comparisons using here uh, 72 uh, different uh, ways to compare the curves and you see uh, where the, the majority of them peaks to. Because it's been known, so unfortunately I don't have the cartoon, but uh, uh, many, many years ago uh, the group of Chuck Fadley and his group uh, tried the different <coughs> R-factor analysis on the same test case and they almost found different uh, results for each uh, R-factor analysis. So it was uh, just a position of an atom with respect to a surface, but the R factors, the different R factors were giving different results. So that's a problem. Okay, so, and now, so the, 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 the new generation of the cluster is done using ASC, which you saw on Monday, and I guess that uh, you will go through it again with the Silva uh, later today. Uh, so uh, there is uh, so the development version. So now there is ESC to compute the cluster. 
there is Matplotlib, with, uh, which uh, ask uh, uh, George Larson uh, uh, mentioned on uh, on Monday to uh, to plot the results, and so they are uh, so ASE okay is, is used uh, for this, uh, Matplotlib for the older plots. So the the widgets are used for the windows and uh, and the, the menus. Uh, the viewers and so on, and you got the 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 ab initial code which uh, you can use um, as an entry point to uh, to MSpec. Uh, there is a new uh, graphical interface in uh, onto development uh, to replace the old ones, the old one that I did. Okay, now it comes to the current developments. Uh, so the ecosystem uh, gravitating around uh, the code. So here is a small sketch, but uh, I, I will go through the different uh, ones uh, and with the name of the people uh, involved. So uh, the the T matrix calculation is done by a code called uh, Phagen, phase generation originally, uh, which is a fork of a code uh, developed by Reno Natoli originally for uh, X ray absorption. Uh, so uh, up to now, it was uh, there was no uh, relativistic effects included. Now you can do s uh, scalar relativistic calculations of the T matrices and the uh, radial matrix elements. Uh, so that's the integral of the the um, the integral of the of the radial the radial integrals. Uh, you can uh, do spin orbit resolved. So concerning the photo electron inter uh, photon electron interaction, up to now uh, we had only electric dipole. Then you've pushed we've pushed it uh, higher up in the in the, the multipolar expansion. So I don't think that these are very useful, but it was uh, it was easy to do it. So we implemented it. But now nowadays you can uh, you can access uh, to quadruple effects in spectroscopies. Um, we have uh, implemented as well uh, electron-electron interaction, so all the radial integrals that are necessary for uh, yields. So yields, for those of you who are not familiar, you've got one electron that it's basically uh, a lead experiment. So you've got one electron uh, arriving onto your uh, sample, and then it is scattered by the electrons, of course, but it can excite uh, through a Coulomb interaction, another electron which is ejected and makes a loss to the uh, in incoming electron. So the scattered electron suffers a loss. Uh, E2E, it's uh, basically the same idea as um, OG photoelectron uh, spe coincidence spectroscopy. It's a coincidence spectroscopy. So again, it's like ILS, except that in ILS, uh, the excited electron, the loss electron, is not detected. It vanishes into the, the, the material. In E2E, you've got another detector, and you detect in coincidence, so again within uh, 10 or 20 nanoseconds, you detect the excited electron that has been excited through the uh, Coulomb interaction. Um, now, at the moment, uh, the code uh, is goes from zero, the, 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 the type of uh, kinetic energies uh, you can use go from uh, from from the the edge uh, to about uh, 1.52 kiloEV. Uh, now this is not sufficient for a hapex. Uh, so with uh, when uh, Fook where is he? Ah, yeah. When Fook comes to Ren, uh, we will uh, try to push to see if the actual version can be pushed uh, further up. Uh, but I'm. Um, not optimistic that we can go uh, up to 10 kilo EV or 20 kilo EV. So we are starting to develop another approach based on the on the Glauber multiple scattering. If you remember the taxonomy map that I, I draw uh, in one of the last slides of uh, my introductory talk, uh, this is what is used in uh, nuclear physics for energies uh, for energies in the uh, of the order of the the mega or the tera electron volts and this is the impact parameter representation uh, so this is already uh, done for the calculation of the t matrices this is not yet implemented uh, in this multiple scattering approach in this case you need to linearize your propagator so that means that you'll have to uh, so instead of uh, instead of expanding in terms of uh, of uh, spherical waves you will expand 
in terms of your impact parameter representation, which is a continuous quantity, so that means that you'll have matrices, and you'll have to discretize, and you'll have ma a, a matrix uh, approach. And what we are just uh, starting to do is uh, introduce the scattering time delay. Um, which will give you some new damping. Uh, scattering time delay is that, uh, okay, this was studied no, especially by, well, by many people at the moment. It's related to the, I don't know if you've heard about this, in uh, the tunneling time. So the time it takes the electron to tunnel through a potential. And the scattering time delay is that you've got your scattering here, you've got your incoming electron, and then you've got your scattered electron, but as uh, every, uh, as we all talked uh, to you uh, during this, uh, this school, uh, the, scattering, uh, the scattering solution is the superposition, the, the, the final solution is the superposition of the incoming wave and the scattered wave, and of course ta scattering takes time. So that means that there will be a small time delay between uh, the incoming wave that has not seen the potential. So the solution, you remember, it's uh, the final solution is exponential <coughs> IKR plus uh, far away plus F T exponential i k r over uh, k r. So there will be a time delay between these two. Okay, and okay, we don't take here into account the the time, but otherwise it it should be min here minus omega t. Okay, so there will be a, a tau, a time delay which uh, we have implemented the Wigner's. A time delay, which is, uh, can be easily computed as, uh, deriv as a derivative of the phase shifts. Okay, so uh, the second module, uh, which has been uh, a module which has been added, uh, was uh, has been developed by Yaki Rokoide, uh, my uh, uh, latest postdoc. Uh, who then joined? Uh, uh, who then joined? Uh, I don't remember the name of uh, this uh, uh, synchrotron in uh, Japan, and now is uh, is join uh, a company. And Rino Natoli. So this is uh, a database of uh, scattering amplitudes. So for going from zero to one kilo five EV and for all the elements of the Mendeleev table. So you click on an element, there is a graphical interface, you click on an element, then there is a menu, you answer what you want, and it will build you uh, the, uh, it, it will give you all sort of information. So you can uh, plot, of course, you've got, uh, you can have transport cross sections, you can have, uh, okay, angular, forward scattering, back scattering, etc. Uh, you can plot the phase shifts, you can plot m many things, the, the T matrix, the S matrix, etc. Uh, so it's not published yet, but uh, it should be published, uh, sent soon to computer physics communication. So it is a, a side module that you can use also uh, for uh, MSPEC. Uh, now, the latest version has been completely rewritten, so now it's, uh, it's in Fortran 90, but the one you are going to use is still in Fortran 77. But the problem is that originally MSPEC was written to, be to do uh, <coughs> photoelectron diffraction calculation, so just one electron involved. And then, uh, when we started to work on Apex, Apex uh, OG photoelectron coincidence spectroscopy, you, had two, you have two electrons involved. Uh, and you so and now uh, there is E3E, but my my uh, Indian colleague uh, Rakesh Chobisa works also on the modeling, but in atomic physics of E uh, of E3E, so three excited electrons. So that means that the the the, the structure of the code was not at all uh, suitable for this. So now you've got uh, the code is structured in terms of beams incoming beams, outgoing beams, or undetected beams in the case of, for instance, uh, eels. You've got the, your uh, loss electron, which you do not detect, which vanishes uh, into your, uh, your material. So now you can, uh, the, the code is uh, structured so as to accept uh, one photon beam incoming, one photon beam uh, outgoing, one incoming electron beam, one undetected electron, so the loss beam, and three outgoing electron beams. So as I mentioned before, we can go higher up in the electron photon interaction. And there are now six uh, uh, algorithms to compute the, the scattering amplitude. Uh, 
because of course you have always to pl to to play be to to find a balance between uh, uh, the accuracy and the CPU time. Uh, so the the the, the historical. Uh, one matrix inversion, correlation expansion, series expansion. So the renormalized uh, series expansion, which we have just uh, so Sylvain has already done some tests with Aika, Takatsu, and so on. Uh, symmetrized series expansion and uh, well, you don't see it. And the matrix series expansion. Okay. Uh, I will not go through all of them, but okay, uh, the full expansion, uh, full potential approach uh, exists, but it's not in the standard version. So we are working currently, as I said, uh, on Glauber multiple scattering. So I, I mentioned partitioning in my introductory lecture. Uh, um, so ELS is under development and E2E. Uh, with uh, my uh, Russian colleagues, uh, the group of uh, Alexander Novakovich and Anna Taranukina, uh, we are working on the implementation of uh, Rex uh, in, uh, in the MSPEC code and in their own code because Peter Kruger um, described uh, multi-channel uh, multiple scattering theory on Monday uh, but actually there are two groups uh, who have developed uh, comparable but uh, slightly different blends of multi-channel multiple scattering theory. So there is on the one hand uh, Rino Natoli and uh, Peter Kruger and on the other hand uh, there is uh, Sasha Novakovic and uh, Anna Taranukina. Uh, we started to mo try to model BEAM uh, with uh, KSK Hatada during his, uh, one of his postdocs. It's not yet implemented and there is an alternative implementation of BIM which has been done in our group uh, by uh, Jan Clavo and uh, Sergio Di Matteo and uh, now Sergio asked me the <coughs> to implement this approach based on the Keldish screen function to implement it in MSPEC. So we are going to do this when we can. But okay, this is in the... And uh, on fr Friday, uh, my PhD student, Aditi Mondal, will give a talk on what we are doing at the moment. That means trying to, uh, to model uh, photo emission uh, energy, electron energy loss spectroscopy. So the idea is that um, normally uh, when you've got a photo emission peak, actually, <coughs> well, it's a bad photo emission peak. Uh, you, you have also other peaks and in particular plasma peaks. Uh, that means that uh, they correspond to electrons that have suffered uh, loss uh, due to the excitation of one plasma. And you can do the same photoelectron diffraction on this plasma peak instead of doing it on uh, the uh, core peak. And this will give you access to information on the dielectric function. So this is uh, a spectroscopy that has been pioneered by uh, Christian Godet in Rennes and Denis David and his group in uh, Salvador de Bahia in uh, Brazil. So we started, I had a master student, uh, Vladislav Kochetov, uh, who was at that time uh, at in Rostov University, Rostov and Don University in a group of uh, Alexander Novakovic and uh, Ta Anna Taranukina, who started the work and then it's been taken over uh, by uh, Aditi and she will uh, present you present you some uh, uh, ways to uh, to model the dielectric function, which is the key quantity we have to enter in order to blend uh, plasma with uh, multiple scattering. Okay, I will be quick on this because the KSK. Uh, uh, already uh, showed you uh, all these results that uh, are part of the, the PhD of uh, thesis of uh, Fukiko Ota. So this is a work that was done with uh, two uh, Japanese uh, <coughs> quantum chemists. And uh, so it's just a way to, to implement some time resolution into photoelectron diffraction. Uh, with, uh, with Jan, and other people, uh, we are uh, we have uh, an ongoing uh, uh, pro European proposal, and in this framework, uh, 
concerning MS spec, we will develop a spin resolve. Uh, so as I mentioned, scattering time, and there is a plan to implement, to incorporate, to Im import from MS spec not on not only the, the not the potential but the, the T matrices uh, with uh, that that incorporate DMFT. Okay. So uh, there are the tutorials, so if you go to the website you will see that there are several online tutorials, so I think that today you will follow some of them uh, with Sylvain, so all of them have been developed with Sylvain, so in general they are uh, taken from, uh, experiment re results are taken from a, from a paper published and then trying to reproduce, to model uh, the experiments in, the, in this paper. And it starts by the, the, the basics, just uh, how to produce uh, photoelectron diffraction pattern. Uh, so, okay, there is a toolbox, but I don't go through this. So, there are hundreds of uh, Fortran modules that can be used by developers. Uh, so, I mentioned uh, this, uh, the, 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 the different tools to compare two spectra. Uh, and uh, we plan to go towards machine learning as well. So, for instance, in um, in PSI, uh, Matthias Mundfiller has uh, developed uh, a machine learning approach uh, to uh, photoelectron diffraction, and one of the ideas is to try to see how we can blend this uh, with multiple scattering. Okay, is it the end? No, ah yes. So this is a little bit what Aditi will talk on, uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, so we have implemented uh, dozens of uh, ways to, uh, to compute electron dielectric functions for homogeneous system. So I had a small discussion with uh, Jérôme uh, the other day uh, concerning the, the ab initio dielectric function because it happens that uh, uh, your the Darsbury code, uh, to my knowledge, is the only one, uh, maybe VASP, that is able to compute dielectric function for any values of the momentum of the plasma because uh, in most of the uh, ab initio codes uh, people are interested in, um, in uh, optical properties and it's everything is done at q equal to zero. But in our case we need uh, q, uh, uh, the momentum of the plasma. In photoemission we have to integrate over all the possible values of the momentum of the plasma. And in uh, EELS for instance, in electron energy electron loss spectroscopy, you can uh, have you, you can visualize uh, the momentum of the the the, the, the plasma of, of given momentum for low uh, for low momenta. So we really need uh, the the momentum uh, uh, to, to, to to be able to describe the dielectric function for for non-zero uh, momenta. Uh, so this description. Uh, involves, uh, so it's for any type of dimensionality and it almost any type of materials. So for semiconductors there is a database of effective masses that have been uh, uh, done by uh, a master student. Uh, we go, for the moment we have coded, uh, pair cor we have incorporated pair correlations but uh, I plan to incorporate triplet correlation just to check if they matter or not. Um, of course, all of, no, all of you know the RPA uh, dielectric function, which is the, 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 the standard and, 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 and basic ones. Uh, one of the problems of the RPA uh, correlation function, apart from the fact that they, it doesn't include pair correlation, is that it doesn't conserve the number of particles. So we have implemented ways uh, to, uh, to build a dielectric function that conserves all the, the, the usual uh, physical quantities. And uh, so numerous types of damping, so not only relaxation time, but uh, other types of uh, damping. Uh, there is one method uh, which is extremely interesting, which is called the uh, memory function approach uh, to, the, to this, which allows you to include different decay channels on different time scales. Uh, so I have a master student uh, in, uh, in uh, India who is working on the, the same but the modeling of phonon dielectric function so that we can couple the two. And what we would like, and this is what I discussed with uh, Jérôme, is to, uh, to try to see what is the effect of the, the, the electronic structure and the crystallographic structure on 
the, the many body effects, so that means compare an ab initio a dielectric function with what we are doing for homogeneous systems. So homogeneous systems, that means that we have only electrons, uh, there is no structure, no band, and there are no atoms. So here is, uh, for instance, uh, an example. Uh, so here we took uh, the aluminium uh, case, uh, so a Wigner size, a Wigner size radius of uh, 2.072, and we took uh, relaxation of the system of uh, relaxation time of 0 0.5 femtoseconds, and here you see uh, the Mermin approach, which is basically the RPA plus uh, damping to do due to the relaxation time. Uh, in that case, uh, you see that this is uh, the dashed line here is. Uh, no, it's this one, sorry. Yes, no, this is this one. The dashed line is uh, the uh, RPA uh, plasmon energy, so the dispersion of the, the plasmon. And you see that, okay, the mermin uh, uh, follows the RPA uh, because there, are no correlation, there is no correlations in the mermin approach as well. Uh, so this is uh, the imagery part, so you see that uh, in contrast to the RPA, where you've got only, uh, I should have put the RPA actually, there is only this, uh, uh, the, the, this electron hole pair uh, continuum where there is damping in the RPA here, you've got also damping along all the, uh, all the dispersion of the plasma. And uh, I mentioned the memory function approach, so here is an example uh, with the call call type of uh, of uh, the, uh, memory function, and you see that here it's completely different because now uh, we incorporate uh, doublet correlations. And of course from this you can compute uh, the structure uh, factor, uh, which is basically what you measure in eels, for instance. Okay, so uh, basis, I, I won't mention it. Uh, there is a, a, a graphical interface that is uh, Developed essentially by Guillaume, and who had the head of the the, uh, the head of uh, uh, School of Engineering student, and uh, Sylvain. And Sylvain has developed a number of uh, tools, and especially some plotting tools that you can control uh, with the mouse uh, to plot the dielectric function. Okay, so I think I will stop on this slide. So uh, originally. We had uh, the LMTO, we could import the LMTO uh, potential. Uh, now we can do VASP, it's almost completed. Uh, MOLCAS, which has been uh, developed by Fukikuota. And uh, I think we'll see it today as SPRKKR. So it's uh, <coughs> Sylvain, uh, Jan, and Alberto uh, who did most of the job with the help of uh, Hubert and uh, Rino Natoli. Uh, the idea also is to be able to import wave functions and to import dielectric functions. This is something we'll see with uh, Jérôme. And concerning the cluster, so now it's generated with ASC, and I don't know if Sylvain will show you, but now you can optimize the structure with GPO and use it as an input cluster uh, for the photoelectron diffraction. Now I think I'll stop here. Uh, if you have any questions. If not, uh, Sylvain, do you have something that would uh, last uh, 20 minutes or not? Yeah. So for the shape matching portion, is that like... For the what? For the shape matching? Um, yeah. Do you like make a closed surface and do a Voronoid isolation or something like that? It's just um, uh, a transformation that makes... Uh, the, 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 the idea is... Uh, the, the transformation is based on the transformation that transforms a uh, line. Well, uh, with two uh, into a circle, so I do this transformation for the for the line, and I apply the same transformation uh, to your to the experimental curve or the and the calculated curve. Uh, it's this uh, transformation that is used to make it into a shape, on which you can use the shape analysis methods. Yes, Peter. Yeah. Be because you've got, you have to add uh, minus omega times the delay. 
because normally we don't take into account the time. But if you take into account the time, uh, there will be a minus omega tau, if you call tau the delay. Uh, OK, we will discuss it. There will be a delay on each, uh, on each partial wave. Yeah, theory. yeah. So it's on time dependent theory. No, but the, the still you should have a delay between the two. Okay, we will discuss this. Sylvain, you have uh, time to do, or shall we make the break now? Perhaps it's better to, to make the break now. Okay. And, uh, so we meet at uh, 11, that's fine for you? Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just one, 